Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? You have found what I will assume one day in the near future will be a long lost episode of uh, <laughs> Double Feature. My name is Eric and uh, recording with me today in the studio is Michael Kester. Yeah, thanks. Happy to be here. Really had a good time today. Oh, I wasn't welcoming you. I was just saying you happen to be around. I know. That's and all. I said I'm really happy to be here and I had a really good time today. And thanks for letting me in. You know, you don't have to be such a dick about it all the time. I'm sorry. We're doing uh, the sixth Rocky film. That, that's yep. my way of getting around you correcting me and saying Rocky Balboa every it's time. It's called Rocky Balboa. Rocky Six and Tokyo Gore Police. <laughs> I believe the title of the show will affirm that I am correct. Rocky Six, Tokyo Gore Police. It actually may present a challenge for us to spoil some of these films. You would think we'd um, have gotten good about that uh, but by this point. It just sometimes you come you come into a pair of films that really just don't like to be spoiled. No, they don't. And uh, when that happens, you, you put insert... half of them on the show, and then you put Rocky Six with that half. Right, and then for everybody else, you put chapters in your menu, and sure. you can skip right past the one with the weird shit and go straight to Tokyo Gore Police. Yeah, because that's not the weird film of the two. Um, the sixth Rocky film is the end of a six-film fucking epic, so obviously it'll have spoilers. Yeah. Tokyo Gore Police is the second film. So let's start with Rocky Six, which uh, is a movie from 2006, and that's a long goddamn time after the previous Rocky film. We Rocky Five. About. That it, it is, and it's it's actually really jarring to watch um to watch a Rocky film that comes out in our lifetime. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. I, I say that loosely because we were alive for many of the other Rocky films. Sure, sure. Um, but it. Oh, looks, I know what you mean. Though it looks like movies that have come out since we've seen movies. Yes, as opposed to a movie that came out a long time ago when movies looked that way. Right. You know what I mean? We never really left the eighties in my head. Yeah. until this film exactly. started. And already we're separating ourselves from the previous movies with this intro. You know, every time they do a slightly different take on the intro, we get all excited. Uh -huh. But there is no previously on Rocky fight yeah. in the beginning of this movie. Well, but that's probably because they would have to reprise a street battle. Well, yeah, I mean, it could be that. You know, I think they just want to they wanna give you a focus on Dixon. They're telling a different story. It's, um, if we start doing previously on Rocky... Here's the thing. This doesn't play with the timeline. We haven't mentioned this timeline the whole time we've done this series. Mm. But these movies have a very strange... I mean, sometimes they come out years later, but are supposed to take place right after the previous right. events. Uh, the continuity doesn't really make a lot of sense in you know the development of Rocky's kid. Or Polly's robot. Or, or Polly's snow cone addiction. Robot. So cyclical of you to bring it all back around. It's like you just watched the same fucking movie I did. <laughs> but you know what I mean. It's um, it's this whole time we're playing this game with the timeline, mm -hmm. and now we're just saying that was a long goddamn time ago. Yeah. That's all you need to know. Totally different. We're what if talk Spinner about... Dunn became Rocky? Yeah, yeah. That's also something we've been avoiding talking about yeah. for all these films. But I have a feeling we're going to arrive there, and we're going <laughs> to arrive there pretty fucking fast. <clears throat> So yeah, you're right. You feel how much later it is. Yeah. You feel that immediately. It uh, it looks so much later. It does. I mean, it's not just Stallone and the actors and stuff. Although Paulie, especially Paulie, looks like that old caricature now. Yeah. I didn't realize he was going to grow into that. But I if you ever wonder what that guy was like when he's younger, he yeah. was Paulie the whole time. I'm so mad that Paulie made it all the way through. He is the sole survivor it of the Rocky drives franchise. Drives me insane. So Adrian's dead, Sylvester Stallone is a bar, and this movie, this is something I, I never thought I'd admire in the Rocky films, but the color and the the technical precision of this movie is really pretty astonishing. Sure. Well, that's that's a Stallone staple if you look back at uh, Rambo or oh, sure. The Expendables. He's, he's, he's got some directing chops when it comes to a technical stuff, which I wouldn't expect. I expect a lot of heart to come yeah. out of Stallone movies, but it's actually impressive the way the films look well, but this one doesn't look like well i guess the expendables didn't really look like rambo yeah they either. don't look alike but they all look good i'm uh, amazed how i mean when you see this movie it's 
uh, it's really vibrant. The mm-hmm. I'm talking specifically about the colors, I guess. There's there's a lot of variation in that stuff. It doesn't rely on one color scheme. You know, when you think about Rambo, they found the effective color scheme there. Sure. It's desaturated jungle and dark, realistic blood. Yep. And that lends itself to so much of the gore and what they were doing in Rambo. In Rocky, it's fucking colorful. It's like some kind of gritty rainbow or something. Sure. Well, it kind of, it's it's really reminiscent of the earlier Rocky films when he steps in the ring and sure. you know, there's all the color and yeah, there's, yeah, I guess that's true. There's Apollo Creed in his, right. you know, red, white and blues. And then there's it's the Ivan the Drago films. and his bright red. I mean, all the boxing guys have bright colors sure. on. So sure. it, it stands to reason that the film that is supposed to iconify Rocky Balboa as, as, as if it needed to be done. Right. I mean, that showboating, especially for a movie about an exhibition match. Right. In any of the other films, we have no WrestleMania in this film. We have no Apollo Creed, anything about Apollo Creed. No one's riding out on a horse in a fucking George Washington. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not, that stuff isn't there. Instead, the movie just has that fantastical look to it. Mm-hmm. Especially, I mean, when you get outside and you have that cool white street lighting, um, like when Rocky introduces the idea to his son of fighting again. There's that nice white backlight. It gives him a, a really crisp uh, kind of white outline. It's something that I think I'm, I'm kind of drawn to because if you've ever shot anything in Chicago at night, you just get this uh, orange haze over everything. Everything's just bathed in ugly or completely washes out everything you're shooting. No washed out Chicago streets, crisp white outlines instead. It's almost that aqua kind of stuff we talked about when we did uh, Rare Exports. Yeah. And you were talking about sometimes you're just in the mood to watch a good-looking yeah, horror movie totally. like that. Somehow Rocky Six is a good-looking yeah, horror movie is. of a uh, a drama. It's, you know, it's all 35 millimeter stuff, too. I, I guess except some of the stuff at the end, but we can talk about that later. Uh, I want to talk about that catch-up that you do. That kind of, hey, it's Rocky 15 years later, right. Adrian's dead. Uh, spend time figuring out what's changed. Where's kind his of. kid? Why well, is so the spinner thing... Around? The spinner done thing. Explain that really quick. Okay, so uh, I, I I noticed it really heavily when we were watching Rocky Five, but mm-hmm. in Death to Smoochie, which is a film we covered back in the second year of the show, yeah, um, one of our favorite black comedies of oh, all totally, time. Totally, there's a character who's an ex boxer named Spinner Dunn, and he he works at this restaurant. He's the restaurant's mascot. He wears a burgundy jacket <laughs> right. and goes around the restaurant talking to people about. His, his boxing, boxing career. Days, yeah. And I noticed that in Rocky Five, Rocky was starting to get the spinner done kind of yeah. punch drunk charisma. Sure. A little dim in the head just because he's, you know, a little he's not a That's brilliant always been guy. part of his charm, yeah. Um and then in this film it starts with Rocky in a burgundy jacket yeah. talking about his boxing career because he's the mascot at the restaurant. <laughs> just like old Spinner Dunn. Minus the triangle. It's weird how all of that happened. It's weird. I'm almost positive Death to Smoochie is before Rocky Balboa, yeah, is it not? it is. It has sure. to be, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. Oh, weird. So Rocky gets to the restaurant, but not before going through his day of, you know, remembering Adrian yeah. and kind of revisiting those places. Uh, as you're thinking in your head, you know, Rocky's remembering the good times, the bad times. Uh, Paulie's reminding him, yeah, you gave me that same speech last year. Yeah. I think about how Paulie is, he has, you know, he can't remember the good times and the bad times. All his times were bad. Yeah. He has no, Paulie's now reached the end of his life and has nothing to show for it. Paulie has always been the curmudgeon figure. Sure. And I feel like maybe they didn't realize that about the character until this film. Yeah. When now Paulie has to stand up and be the miserable guy because they never gave him a moment. Honestly. He never had is, a moment. Yeah. This is this is not as a joke, even though this is the constant joke with Rocky now. The best moment in Paulie's life was the fucking robot. It really was. Yeah. He has nothing to show for it now. He's almost the tragic figure here. Uh, it goes unspoken through the movie, but Paulie's at the end of his life, and if he ever had a high out of his birthday party, it was in helping Rocky once in a while do Rocky's own thing. Now his fucking sister's dead. He doesn't even seem to show any remorse. His life is just a, a miserable wreck. He's Way a to painter. go, Paulie. And yeah, I... he does paint. Okay, so we do we can give him that. Sure. He uh, provides all the artwork for 
Rocky's uh, Rocky's restaurant. Yeah, and I still don't like him. He also discovers that fight. He's the one who kind of shows that to Rocky for the first time, the simulated fight. Cartoon fight. Which, I mean, I'm glad, one, that they mock it as the cartoon fight yeah. because the first time I see it, I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. That they're really using this as the premise. Right. But they do that great thing where they show the real-life precedent yeah, for sure. the simulated fight. Because I didn't know that. And yeah, I didn't either. Had they not done that, I would have thought, this is nuts. You cannot expect me to believe this. But let that be a lesson to everybody who sits in their armchair, pompously shaking their fist at films, going, you expect me to buy this? Right. All you have to believe is that individuals before this film came up with a concept, and no longer is it suspension of disbelief. It's a crazy thing that we're calling out from the actual world of sports. So looking at the final theme of the Rocky franchise... Rocky's talking about, he uses this metaphor, I think it's stuff in the basement, yeah, right? Yeah, he, he says stuff in the basement and motions to his chest, Sure. Uh, which it seems like a metaphor for a metaphor. It's where um, he thinks his heart is, I believe. Right, but the thing that's weird is he says stuff in the basement to refer to feelings in his heart, sure. which is also within itself a metaphor for stuff in his head. Sure, yeah. And it's it's just this, it's a rationale for why he needs to fight again. Right. It's a combination of uh, pent-up rage and emotion, mm -hmm. and I think a deep-down desire to prove to himself and to the world that he's still a viable human being. Sure. He's lost Adrian, and that was such an identifying character for Rocky. Yeah. That without her, I think he lands himself back in a place where he doesn't want to just sit and be spin or done. Yeah. And live out the rest of his days thinking, well, once Adrian died, I became a parody of myself. Sure. Sure. Um, and maybe he needs to re identify himself publicly as just not necessarily as a winner, but as a contender, as yeah. a fighter. That's what he was always good at. That's what defined his life. And I think he's kind of lost a sense of who he is a sure. little bit. He's fallen into Rocky Balboa, a restaurant owner, and uh, and just wants to get back to at his core what you know he's known for, what he's become a legend for. The way they convince him to get back into this fight is by appealing to his sense of storytelling. You know that's his only connection to who he used to be is being at this restaurant and telling people the stories. It's not the um, you know when we talked about Spinner Dunn, we talked about kind of exploiting this guy who you know was uh, a legend himself in the right. the small canon he got in that movie. And when I see that movie, I almost think, well, that's sad for him. But Rocky, this those are his golden days. Right, that excites him. Sure, you know that's the uh, the stuff he has to tell people about, and he likes that. And so now we're in a position with this movie where. You know, every time one of these comes out, we have to give Rocky an excuse to fight. Mm -hmm. And that almost seems like uh, a large part of whether or not the movie's going to be viable is, sure. well, Rocky retires every goddamn time. Why is he fighting? Well, again? and that was a large part of what I liked about the fifth film is because they skirt that and they yeah. finally go, he doesn't always have to go back in and sure. be a defender of his title. So I'd mentioned previously, I hadn't seen the film before I was saving it for sure. our... Uh, year-long project here as the only Rocky film I hadn't seen. So I wasn't sure what that excuse would be. I didn't know anything about the film uh, coming up. And I think it's, it's really authentic the way... I mean, they try and convince him by saying, okay, you will have new stories to tell. That's, uh, that's something that... It's not necessarily that he does it just for the stories. I mean, right. he doesn't. But it reminds him, oh, this is why you're running around telling stories now. Yeah. And so, you know, I say it's authentic because he's having this fight because he's conflicted about what he's good at. He wants to, basically, he wants to keep doing boxing because it's, it's almost art for him. It's that thing. He just has to create it. It's what he's good at. Right. He's driven for it. He has to go back to it. He wants to continue his life in that way. It isn't as if, uh, you know, it's maybe easier to find by looking at the flip side of that. It's not an arbitrary thing that for some reason... Turns out he has to fight in order to achieve this goal. Right. It's not you lost all your money, so you have to fight or, you know, whatever the case may be. It always seems like the movies come up with fighting as the answer to a question nobody cares about. Because in the film, you have to have Rocky fighting. That's what people want to see. And so you go, well, I don't know. There's a guy from the Cold War or here comes a new challenger or Rocky's poor or Something happens. It doesn't really matter what the something is. What matters is the only way to resolve it is fighting. Right. Instead, in this movie, he just goes, well, I want to fight again. I, you know, I did this for over a decade and it's not me. And I feel 
just this desire inside where I have to return to the ring. It kind of the reason you make a movie like this. Yeah. You feel like, I mean, the creators want to make another Rocky movie. They have a burning artistic desire in themselves where they feel like, you know what? I got another Rocky story in here. I want to get that out. Yeah. The same way Rocky does with a fight. I wanted to ask you this question about um, his son living in a shadow, though. Yeah. Because when we talked about the fifth film, we talked about a lot of that being a kind of a strange story with his son. And, right. Uh, gave the movie a lot more credit than I think most people did because of the, the bizarre things it did. Milo, the he's an actor from Heroes, and he does some voice work. Surprisingly, it's Wolverine. Huh. Um, he plays Rocky's son in this, and he... Uh, you know, there's the, the scene with the pretty lighting. Yeah. The outdoor backlit, all that good stuff. He talks in one of those about Rocky having this kind of casting this huge shadow over him and what it's like to almost to say, well, the nerve of you, you know, sure. if you're going to come back to boxing, do you realize how hard that is for me? Yeah. And that made sense once upon a time for Adrian because they're a family unit and he put her through hardships right. by straining himself. Sure. But do you think he has a responsibility to his son? to, you know, be less popular and not create a larger shadow? I it's it's a really difficult dynamic because I don't have kids. Sure. Um and with Adrian, it's kind of a situation where she did choose to be that way and sure. Rocky asked her to be in that position. Uh so she's allowed to explain when she doesn't want to be in that position. And I'm not faulting his kid for saying for being born. <laughs> right. I'm not faulting him for saying that you can't do this, think of what this will do to me. But at the same time, I feel like his rationale is so far overshadowed mm -hmm. by Rocky's need and Rocky's desire in that situation. I feel like if Rocky were saying something along the lines of, yeah, I figured I could make a few bucks by boxing again, so I was thinking I'd do that, then maybe the son's desire for self-identity would overshadow sure. Rocky picking up an extra bit of scratch. But in a situation where Rocky needs to re-identify himself as a human being, I feel like his son should man up and fucking understand sure. that sometimes his father is an important human being. and He not, also has things going on in his right, life. And, and not try to identify, not try to force his father to re-identify himself through his son. Yeah, that's one of the things that always in my head makes me think, oh, I could never have kids because I never want to be anything... Other than just myself. Right. I never want to be put in a position where, and maybe that's selfish to me, I don't know, but to raise another human being and to have someone depend on you like that. Sure. I mean, I'd like to define myself by defining myself. I don't ever want to get stuck in a spot where I am defined by my offspring. Oh, what are you? What is your day-to-day -day life? Well, I'm a parent. You know, that seems like you've left behind everything you used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know what happened to Rocky in this decade. I mean... Maybe, you know, he lost Adrian and it seems like he had a falling out with his son. So I don't feel like he really had to get away from boxing to take care of his son or anything. But this is certainly new for his kid. I mean, yeah. he's not used to, well, my dad's going to be in the spotlight again. I could see where it's hard for him. I could see where it's stressful, I guess. But he does eventually reach the decision to support his dad, yeah. right? I mean, he's in sure. the ring with him. Well, it's because Rocky kind of points out... You're asking me to do this to maintain your miserable lifestyle. Yeah, right, right. And his son his son retracts a little bit and says, "You're right. I am miserable. Fuck that. I'm going to support you." Yeah, it's not a not a great life that he's living anyways. And I could see where he thinks, you know, "Oh, I've only gotten as far as I got because I'm your son." But I'm not really sure that spot that he got was so great. Yeah, exactly. And he realizes that too. So when Rocky gets out to Vegas and we go to do this match, I'm thinking we're in a uh, we're in an ice truck kind of. Um, when we talked about Joyride, we talked about the ice truck thing. Yeah, there being uh, something that shows up that you know will end your film, but it shows up halfway through the fucking movie. Right. So you look at your watch and you go, "Yeah, nice try," but I don't buy that for a second. So we get out there and it's uh, boxing time already. And I know this is one of the longer, or at least in my head, it's that's probably sure. not even true, but is one of the longer Rocky films. Mm -hmm. So when we get out to Vegas, I'm thinking. Is there going to be two matches? We can't possibly do a boxing match right. already. I'm anticipating we're going to have that ice truck moment. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a little bit of a press event or whatever, but we do move into the boxing pretty quickly. Yep. True to Rocky form, it does give us, well, let's actually watch the fight and see what happens. Right, but untrue to Rocky form, the fight is so hyper-stylized. 
I mean, we get these, uh, I'm going to refer to them as Gatorade moments where everything is black and white except blood or the color on their shorts. Yeah. It's uh, it's called selective color, selective colorization. It's basically people will identify it as the Sin City thing. Sin City thing, yeah. Despite looking at this and looking at Sin City, you'll see how drastically different those two things are. But, we, but yeah, everything's black and white except splashes of color here and there. And we yeah, and we get a ton of quick cuts and it's a lot of high octane action instead sure. of the typical end of Rocky fights tend to be a still camera hanging over the ring. Sure. Some medium close up shots. Well, Nothing, if you'll remember all the way back to the beginning of the year, we talked about the the beginning of Steadicam use, yeah. you know. And uh, actually making you feel like you're at the at the match, right. that you're present there. But instead, it, it comes off a little bit more like you're watching the match on TV. Sure, sure. Well, I mentioned earlier, we're shooting 35 millimeter uh, for the rest of the movie. Right. It's great how we've just blurred that line between, you know, gorgeous video, it's digital, and gorgeous video, it's film. And, you know, digital video has gotten so good, we can't tell the difference. But this is that kind of um, pay-per-view, HD TV. I mean, when we make the switch to video for the fight, it makes you feel like you're watching it at home mm-hmm. instead of at ringside. Sure. You're not there at all. You're now tuned out of, you know, following Rocky around in his actual life and sitting at home watching the fight or sure. sitting at, you know, a bar in Philly right. watching the fight. It's even got the pay-per-view timer in, yeah. the, in the beginning. And I think where that comes from, because it's a, a strange choice and it could just purely be stylistic for the purpose of, you know, here we are all these years later, people watch these things very frequently at home. Everybody knows what that looks like. Let's do it in that style. But I also think this is a movie about people demanding to see Rocky fight after this computer simulation. So the movie just wants you to have that experience the same way everybody else did. They all clamored to see another Rocky fight. They all got excited about the computer thing. Just in the same way that, you know, everybody hears there's another Rocky movie coming out. There's going to be another Rocky fight. So the the movie kind of wants to put the audience in the position of the people who gather at the bar. Right. Or watch at home. Who heard, okay, there's going to be a Rocky exhibition match. What does that look like? Well, and especially in 2006 when the boxing fans and the people who are who have ever seen boxing. I've almost not seen boxing at all. Sure. The only way I'm familiar with boxing is via television i've never been to a boxing match sure the average person has never been to a physical boxing ring right if you want to see boxing in its truest form especially in 2006 it's fucking cable tv right i mean that's its most widespread form that's how everybody knows it and the other thing they know if you are a boxing fanatic is usually the rocky films yeah Uh, more people know the rocky films than know anything about boxing you see mike fucking tyson at that fight a boxer himself, probably a fan of the Rocky films Yeah, absolutely. And so they end that fight, and you do get, I mean, it's a payoff fight. If you like watching Rocky box, and most fans of this franchise would, you know, we don't talk about it a lot on here, because after the first couple of shows of seeing Rocky box, we kind of knew, all right, what is Eric and Michael's take on that? Sure. So we talk about a lot of the heavier drama stuff, but, you know, the end of the film comes and you and I both get excited to see Rocky box. Yeah, we like so to watch the, the fight. The movie's going to give us as much of the fight as possible. It's going to let him, it's funny, it lets him kind of tie or maybe even lose mm-hmm. by final decision. But uh, that's just a fact in the movie. That has nothing to right. do with the plot or the story or the emotional arc. At the end of the movie, he wins. He throws his arms up, even as they're announcing that he lost Nobody cares because he got what he needed out of it. Sure. It almost reminds me of that in the first movie where, you know, just tying was a victory. Just not losing was a victory. And here it's also that same, you know, not losing is a victory went all of the rounds, but he gave everybody a good show and he got out that thing that was inside of him. Yeah. And so, you know, he wins. All right. So moving into, uh, I guess, The Stranger of the two films, we have this uh, this film called Tokyo Gore Police. And if you didn't know it was called Tokyo Gore Police, the film tells you that this is Tokyo Gore Police. With the throwdown title card, you yeah. mean? Yeah, one of those great, um, I think those Martyrs where we talked about the yeah. title card. Yeah. There's been a lot of good uh, good title. Just bam, Tokyo Gore Police after the uh, the Tokyo Shock original opening. Sure. The massive amounts of ass kicking and... Fucked up inness. Camera vibrating and you know style yeah i think the the really notable thing for everything that's come before us on this show is 
we get finally a triumphant split down the middle yeah that takes the cake finally it's yeah. been done we've been ragging on this stupid choice to to slice people with swords down the middle and have them split apart i mean it's a it's a great idea yeah but it usually looks like crap it, usually, it always looks terrible yeah. and you know we saw it in kill bill and we said okay thanks for somebody doing that right finally but they never did it in the style that is Right, you know, Japanese in gore the way cinema. that it's supposed to look. Yeah, in a sense that it's it's more than what we expected. Right from the second we saw it in Ichi, we knew how it was going to look when it happened. We needed somebody not just to deliver the way Tarantino did, but to actually surprise on top of that. And so when you get tiny streams running yeah. across each other like some kind of internal organ Venus flytrap thing, uh, that is plus one. Yeah, is what that is. Abs fucking lootly. So you want to talk about responses to responses, yeah. which has been the theme yep. of Shogun Assassin to Sex and Fury to Kill Bills to uh, The Machine Girl and now to Tokyo Gore right. Police. I mean, the people who created this movie clearly saw that The Machine Girl took off in the United States right. and made a film that they thought would appeal to a U.S. Yeah, audience. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's really that's why that's why it lands here in, in the end of the journey is we we get a we get a film that has essentially seen the previous five sure. films that we've watched. Yeah. And they just go, how can we do all of that right. better and successfully? Yeah, even Machine Girl. See, yeah. that's what I didn't anticipate. I thought we might do say an early uh Japanese gore thing and a late one. Yeah. And uh in fact, it's one that looks back at Machine Girl and says, "Okay, Here's where the market for this is. Right. Let's exploit that market. I mean, you can see that just in the anime sensibility alone. Right. Anime has to be Japan's biggest achievement in the U.S. kind of film market, just in terms of sheer popularity. Right. Even bigger than the sort of ghost films or the ghost films and the remakes of ghost films combined. Right. Anime has its own shelf on a proverbial, you know, video rental store. It's sure. its own fucking genre. Well, anime, it's huge. I mean, look, watch fucking Cartoon Network for two hours. Yeah, right. You're going to see more anime than American cartoons. It's strange how little we've talked about anime for talking so much about Japanese cinema, because while you and I haven't done a lot of that, if any, I think, on the show, it's, yeah. I, you know, that With piece in Kill Bill, Kill Bill we yeah. didn't even really talk about. That is so much of Japanese film over here. If you were to include anime in Japanese film, then anime is, you know, 90% of Japanese film in America, especially by popularity. Sure. Our anime character then would be, is it Ruka? It's yeah, Ruka, right? Ruka. The, uh, the woman with the trench coat and the miniskirt. Trench which coat, is, miniskirt, and samurai sword. Especially that short tie, you know, the way it shrinks her torso and yeah. exaggerates her legs and... All the time they're shooting her from below to have this. I mean, it's a super anime kind of look. Sure. To well, it. she needs to look huge, and she needs yeah. to look uh, really menacing and formidable. Sure. In every sure. scene, because Ruka is really the only good guy. Right. We have. I mean, the story gets weird, but by the end of it, there's no good guys. Yeah. Ruka is the only remaining protagonist in the film. And if you don't believe by the end of the film that she has slaughtered all of Japan, right. they failed. Yeah, yeah. So they need to make her seem like this absolute fucking force. Well, she's of, the only honest cop by the sure. end, right? That's well, kind she, of the idea yeah. is that one by one, everybody else is exposed. It's, uh, you know, she unravels this vast conspiracy. Right. And discovers that all the other cops are crooked cops. I mean, if you don't buy her, and it's it's a difficult role because she doesn't talk. Sure. She's, it's, it's to go back to a lot of the noir stuff, she's very detective-y. She's very yeah. soft-spoken, very internalized. You don't really understand a lot of what she's doing until she's doing it. Oh, you mean like a silent anime protagonist? Yeah. She uh she shows up in these places. She's face to face with these people, these characters with or without limbs, with or without heads. Sure. And you need to believe that she is there for 100% rational reasons. <laughs> right. Because right. if you don't buy her rationality, the film falls apart. I love how they'll inject pieces of, uh, I hesitate to even call it exposition. It's just this sort of, Okay, okay, this should make sense. Let's hold on for a second, right. and I'll tell you a couple things. 
it's as if the director's pausing it every now and then sure. to go, uh, yeah, actually when I made this, it was a little nutty. So here's what's going on. Yeah, in this absolutely. Scene. There's, I mean, in a scene not unlike the assassin backstory in Kill Bill, we have some assassin backstory, even kind of an animated hybrid going on here. You know, you can almost hear the fucking Kill Bill score from that scene in this movie. I don't think that's a stretch at all. No, not even a little. It's a weird, it's, that's another thing that I, that I really like about Tokyo Gore Police is Mm -hmm. that. Uh, when we talked about Machine Girl, one of the things we mentioned was that it's, I mean, for what it is, it's a pretty straightforward film, a pretty straightforward story. Right. And Tokyo Gore Police gets a lot more ambitious with the actual art of filmmaking. It borrows a lot more from stuff like Kill Bill with the way it's shot, the angles. Sure. Everything's a lot more dramatic and sensationalized. They're basically, they have a lot more balls yeah. with what they're yeah, doing. Right. They're not worried about playing it safe and telling a story that makes 100% sense the whole way through. Hey, drastic choices need to be made, all right? We're privatizing the police force here. Oh, yeah, that's true. I should point out that uh, we are libertarians, not anarcho-capitalists. Uh-huh. So privatizing the police, that might be, uh, let's say, a little extreme for yeah, you and I. Yeah, I'm, I'm still a little nervous about privatizing the police force. But, I mean, that pixelated commercial is <laughs> one of my favorites. Yeah. The, um, well, you know what what I'm talking about. All the commercials are great. I think Amazon Women on the Moon has prepared us to, you know, it's made this film more digestible. Sure. I don't question anything that happens ever. It's kind of like Starship Troopers in a way, too. Yeah, it is. You know, that's what, I always, that's what I always think about, is the, uh, the little commercials in Starship Troopers, do you want to know more? Yeah, it brightens the mood and it gives us kind of a better sense of their, uh, their world. Mm-hmm. Those inserts were actually done by the director of The Machine Girl. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, him and so this is this is kind of a crazy web of stuff I found out during the Machine Girl uh-huh. stuff. And I'm guessing it's going to end in Mitsua. No, that's just where you buy a wrist cutter G. Oh. I think that or maybe the fucking score for this movie. <laughs> that seriously, more heavy guitars in score. I always love heavy guitars in score. That and when the score is you know trip hop gone pop, that whole kind of thing. That Supreme Beings of Leisure or Bittersweet or slow motion scene with the umbrella kind of thing. Uh-huh. Awesome score. I couldn't get enough of that. When the girl with the razor arm is fighting, I mean, oh, it's so fucking good. But the director of The Machine Girl does some of these inserts. The other guy who does the inserts directed the Japanese gore film Meatball Machine. Oh, yeah. Which I haven't seen, but apparently the Meatball Machine guy also wrote the Japanese gore film Versus. Okay. Uh, which I guess was an early one. Yeah. So it's it's what a lot of people consider the beginning before that genre had grown into its own. But the Versus writer also directed Midnight Meat Train. Oh, yeah, that's right. And then Clive Barker was really proud that he brought him over to the States. And... Yeah, yeah. So we had talked about somebody kind of on the peripherals of this genre before, which also brings up your Spaghetti Western question from way back, which is if a Spaghetti Western crew creates an American film, is it still a Spaghetti Western? Yeah. So I don't know. Tell me, is uh, Midnight Meat Train kind of a Japanese gore film? I think, you know, you can have elements of a Japanese gore film. Because suddenly in my head, Midnight Meat Train just got really good yeah, instead well, of really then, weird. The, the thing that brings me out of Midnight Meat Train being a Japanese gore film is Bradley Cooper. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it does look a lot more American that way. Yeah. It's strange that, you know, you bring these films over from Japan, American audiences adore them. You make a Japanese film in America, American audiences don't know what the fuck to think of it. Yeah. So I think it's the commercial inserts that he did. To be honest, I just as with Rocky, I wanted to surprise myself on this. So I don't really know yeah. anything about, not that I ever know anything about any of these fucking <laughs> movies, but definitely not about Tokyo Gore Police. He might have also directed the scenes, uh, the kind of transmissions with sure. the blonde chick. I love her. Those are really Battle Royale. I yeah. know I keep dragging this out, but come on. <laughs> how do you not look at Battle Royale and look at that and just say, I mean, I'm fine with it because if you heard the Battle Royale show, you will know that I fucking loved sure. those little bits. Yeah. The difference is that it's a lot fucking weirder than it Battle Royale. Yeah, right. Um, it's it's similar in the vein that um, you get this, and we talked about it with Machine Girl, mm-hmm. but you get this, there's this need that I've seen in all of this Japanese slaughter cinema yeah, where it's heavy on weapons. 
and machinery and the need to come up with an interesting killing device. Oh, yeah. We talked about that during the end of Machine Girl. Right. We were talking about, uh, you know, using all these body weapons and the ideas of body horror kind of getting woven into that. Sure. I mean, the concept of the engineer yeah. is perfect for a Japanese Absolutely. gore film. I mean, you ask yourself how these films got along without it. Okay, we need weird body weapons, but we're running out of really strange excuses and premises that we ask people to buy right. in order to give our characters these weird weapons. What can we do? I've got an idea. Let's come up with some sort of enemy where when you bloodily and viciously sever a part of their body, it becomes replaced with something more vicious than... They grow a weapon. Yeah. I mean, it's perfect. It's the whole amazing. genre could use this. Oh, my God. I think I don't think it gets better for me than the uh, the girl who becomes halved and then turns into an alli- ha- a half alligator. Sure, right. That is my favorite example of what an engineer can truly accomplish. You know what? Now that I think about it, this was the other thing about the crew that was kind of weird is it's the same effects crew or the same effects guy from the machine girl yeah. that did the stuff in Tokyo Gore Police. There was a lot less work for him in yeah. the machine. Tokyo Gore Police is just Oh my god, it's it's the police as bounty hunters fighting off monsters. It's so good and every every time you think you've seen the best thing that can happen. Again, I go back to the alligator legs, sure. but then you get something like the uh the handgun or just prisoner 613 sure yeah uh which well, you is... mentioned last time that it gets weird but you were not lying yeah the stuff in here is some of the weirder i mean okay so you're going to talk about the prisoner a little bit yeah well we have this this uh it's a quadruple amputee uh-huh. um in a gas mask first you just see her crawling around very akin to the end of freaks yeah but later in the film she sprouts blades yeah. And can climb on walls. And she's basically the concubine sex slave of the ultimate villain <laughs> sure. in the film. But she winds up having... Is it the mini gimp suit that gives you the uh, that idea? Yeah. Well, and the blowjob. All right. Maybe that'll do it. Um, but she winds up uh, with four high-powered machine guns at the end of the film. And I really... That is where that needs to be. Um, and I think... I th- And this was something you pointed out as possibly the weirdest thing. And I'm, I'm laughing now thinking about when you said it, but the scene where the ultimate supervillain, the leader of the police force, sure, sure. gets his legs chopped off. Ruka removes his legs, and his oh, yeah. response is to inject himself with reagent yeah. and then fly around the room on blood rockets. Oh, yeah, obviously. And uh, then we mean? just get an aerial sword fight with blood rockets for a good three or four minutes before he's decapitated and ultimately thwarted. Yeah, here's the amazing part of this, right? Uh, And I absolutely genuinely feel this way, but I was able to pull myself out for just a second, (laughs) just away from the fiction of the movie and go, this is kind of amazing that I'm having this experience right now. Uh, We have that wet lens scene. I'm just going to start calling it that, by the way, when blood sprays all over your lens, because... If the rest of Japanese gore is like these films are, then, you know, all of Asian extreme is just doused in blood all the fucking Uh time. So you get a little wet lens scene, blood's dripping everywhere, body parts are severed, there's a dude flying around. (laughs) And I think to myself, this isn't phasing me at all. Yeah. Yeah, of course, that's what... It, if I had another second to think, I might have thought, well, if you cut off his legs, maybe he'll grow rockets. So that could really be... Sure. I'm now calling the Rocky boxing match. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? I'm thinking, ah, this could be an advantage for him. You see, if he grows some kind of jet pack, he could have the advantage by flying around the room <laughs> right. and shooting things at her from afar. Sure. And it doesn't phase me at all. Yeah. It doesn't bother me. I feel like I should be looking at this and thinking this is the weirdest thing on planet Earth. But I'm not. I think the reason you're not feeling that way is because Double Feature did a somehow successful job on taking you from something. Remember something as tame as Shogun Assassin. Well, Shogun Assassin had that crazy stuff with the baby carrot. I mean, yeah. how would you ever expect to buy that? Yeah. And no. now at the end <laughs> of it. so tame by comparison. It's just, it's, I feel like we did a really good service to people getting, because Tokyo Gore Police is so fucking good. Yeah, it is. It is really good. It's just also so weird that maybe yeah. you can't realize you how don't good it want, is. I didn't, I wanted to bring people into something like Tokyo Gore Police 
in a way where it felt accessible instead sure. of absolutely fucked up. Well, the other thing you could do is just watch the Asia Extreme stuff. Mm-hmm. You could just watch the whole of Japanese gore cinema from the beginning to the end and desensitize yourself to it. But that would take a lot more films and you would have to start pretty fucking weird. I mean, I don't know how weird Versus is or any it's, of the stuff that came before it. It's all strange. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that you jump right into it and then the first 10 films or whatever, you just think, ah, oh, this is weird. And eventually you get to a place where you go, well, I've seen the rest of it. I guess I'm ready for Tokyo Gore Police. Right. And maybe you're desensitized enough to watch one bizarre movie. But instead, the way you've come up with these, uh, these six films here, you start in a place, Shogun Assassin... I mean, we made jokes about baby sure. carriages or whatever, right. but it's a pretty digestible film. Yeah. It's a pretty easy to understand It makes film. sense. <laughs> and then Sex and Fury does some weirder things, but uh, if you can handle a naked samurai, then also a film you totally get. And then you've probably seen Kill Bill, and by the time you get to Machine Girl, that's the hardest leap. Yeah. But the things that Kill Bill does with gore makes it okay. Right. Plus, Machine Girl isn't that complex of a film. No, it's not. Tokyo Gore Police is complex. There's double crosses and backstories and sure. triple crosses and sure. engineers. So now, by the sixth film, suddenly you're totally ready for it, and you never really had a period where you thought, ah, oh, this is so weird, I don't know if I can get it. I mean, maybe you did have that period. What yeah. do I know about everybody universally who's seen these? But what's great is this was an unforeseen amount of success. Uh, You know, the whole time I've been thinking, if we get to the end and see the influences, will the influences be there? And the further we got, you know, the closer to the end we got, the more I thought, well, we can't really say. I mean, by the time we got to Machine Girl, that was a lot of it. We can't really say 100% where the influences are anymore. Sure. This is, uh, you know, when we got into the third wave, it was suddenly... They could be deriving from the older stuff. They could be deriving from Kill Bill. And also, there's a lot of Asian cinema that's come out since Shogun Assassin that we don't know about that they could also be pulling from. But none of that really seems to matter in retrospect because (laughs) this has also, uh, at the same time, been a journey to understand and appreciate Tokyo Gore Police. Yeah. And really, if it took six films for that, I'm totally fine. So uh, we have a website. We do. That's Double Feature Show. Dot com. You got it. We can find the rest of the Rock in Asia stuff. I believe there's a link on the uh, lower right hand corner. If not, you can type Rocky or Asia or something. You would think, as the person who runs that website, I would have a better handle on that. Right. But in fact, the website basically runs itself. Hated Polly, loved Tokyo Gore Police. Uh, you can email us at doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Any or all of the above, or none of the above. Uh, we want to hear your feedback, especially now that we are finally done on uh, what this journey did for you, what you learned coming out of this, if you picked up anything. I mean, you and I watched six films and learned basically nothing, as we always do. (laughs) But uh, I'm sure the listeners picked up on stuff. So please talk to us about it, because we are dying to know, now that it's all done, Did we do good? (laughs) How does the rest of the universe feel about this? What happened to everybody else? Sure. We just accidentally discovered that we learned Tokyo Gore Police along the way. Who knows what other people doing this at home might have uh, might have found out. Next time we're going to do something really happy, really fun, really uplifting. It's the it's the last show of our year. So uh, we're going to do um, a film called Happiness and a film called Kids. So after we've been down in the dirt with uh, all this gore stuff and all this completely surreal stuff and making everybody feel dirty all the time, it's uh, finally time, you might say, to pat our listeners on the back for listening for four long years by maybe giving them uh, just one, just one easy-to-watch double feature this whole year. Jesus Christ. All right, so the version of Happiness we're going to watch, because there's probably a lot of films called that, is Todd Salon's Happiness. And we're going to watch Larry Clark's Kids. Awesome. Watch more fucking film. Bye.